Tara, thank you. And uh, it's actually the last session of the day. So tough session to be in. But I was happy I could actually do it today because I have to head back to SF today, tonight. So happy to be here. Um, thank you again for joining in for this late session. And um, what I'm going to be doing is actually talking about um, web fonts, which is a very interesting technology. Many of you may have heard about it already. Uh, looking at some of the scalability uh, issues that we have been looking at, some of the challenges, some of the solutions, and how we are delivering fonts for different languages at Wikipedia's scale. So how many of you know about web fonts? You do, you do, you do. That's cool. Rowan definitely does. <laughs> Rowan is from our, and Nita does too. And uh, Ron is from our visual editor team, so he's also very familiar with uh, the nuances of language uh, issues and language IMEs and all kinds of cool things around language nowadays. Um, but web fonts are fundamentally fonts, uh, very, very optimized for modern web browsers. Um, and they serve two primary purposes. Today, they make web pages more readable in language, uh, different supported language scripts. And the second is to make web pages pretty, because you want more than one font on a page. So, you know, that's it. That's a general statement. Web, uh, the web all across the world and in different websites needs web fonts, different kinds of fonts in English. It could be in German, it could be in different languages. But beyond that, why does Wikipedia need fonts? Wikipedia is, as you know, you all use Wikipedia, I know, um, is a very text heavy site, right? Wikipedia is especially. And we have millions of pages in different languages which are um, full of content, text content, which is written in Latin scripts as well as non-Latin scripts. And the uh, challenge of making those pages more readable and pretty becomes even more magnified when you have millions of pages. So um, Wikipedia has been rolling out and uh, building web fonts and rolling that out since 2001. We have been doing this um, initially through an extension on MediaWiki called Web Fonts. It was called Narayam initially, came from the uh, Malayalam community out of India, and was incorporated as the MediaWiki Web Fonts ex extension. And then it was migrated to the Universal Language Selector feature, um, which is in short called ULS for Wikimedia websites, uh, in 2013 last year, about, um, about a year now. So what has been the purpose of using web fonts? Um, one, to improve user experience, because we have so many multilingual users who are actually using uh, web fonts worldwide for different languages. Second is to provide users with a choice of fonts um, to be able to render non-Latin languages, which goes back to the original definition that we were talking about. This is good. And um, I'm wondering if, OK. So I think it times out, probably. <laughs> um, so I've got to click more often. So um, providing users uh, with a choice of fonts for different languages, um, in an, in, again, in a readable way, uh, pleasing way, so that, uh, again, fonts don't look like courier fonts, you know, which were typed on typewriters and still look like courier fonts from a different century. Um, and then the third added benefit, which we have really seen people are really, really helped and appreciative of most, is providing accessibility support for uh, fonts, especially for dyslexia. And the open dyslexic font, which is available for many of the languages, including English, has actually been very, very uh, widely used by many of the Wikipedians who are reading Wikipedia on all the way from English Wikipedia to some of the European languages to other languages too. Um, and these are the three areas why Wikipedia really, really has been using web fonts um, and, and will continue to do so until we can actually find that platform inherently in the browser. 
So I want to give you some stats before I deep dive into some of the challenges and in distribution of web fonts and other challenges that I would like to discuss. And uh, some of these stats that I want to give you in terms of the scale of, of the uh, impact of these fonts being rolled out is important to understand. So Wikipedia has 287 languages of content, right? That's a huge number of languages. And most of those languages are non-Latin languages, right? Then the non-Latin scripts. The number of languages that are supported by web fonts actively are 115 out of 287. That's a significant number. Um, and the number of web fonts that we are pushing actively is 82. So that kind of maps over uh, to 82 distinct fonts that we have in our repositories, which are open licensed and actually can be reused by anybody else. And then we have the concept of a system font which means that most of these systems that are coming out of the box, whether so that's your laptop or your desktop, if there is a system font installed, usually the languages that are, you ha have that font support already built in should be able to pick that up. So 49 languages have system fonts usually as a default font, but then there are other fonts, other languages that actually use a default web font, which is very, very interesting because it's quite a high number. It's 66 languages. Um, and that's quite significant. Out of that, I just wanted to note that it's very interesting to see that, you know, a long tail language like Tibetan, right, which is just, just such a unique uh, set of language scripts. 23 of those web fonts are actually in Tibetan. Um, and they use the Jomalhari font family, um, where we shall return. <laughs> on, uh, which is actually a medium-sized font. It's about 352K. Um, and um, uh, it's well used for those 23 scripts. Uh, uh, sorry, 23 fonts, web fonts uh, in Tibetan script. The average font size that we are pushing for out of these 66 web fonts uh, is 153KB. So that's kind of the average that we are working with in terms of sizing. And the smallest font size is 3.6K, so very small uh, number of characters. And then the largest font size, which is 772K, almost a meg, is Akkadian, right? So there are all kinds of interesting stats. Um, I can give you a re uh, URL, which we have all the f languages listed on our mediawiki.org documentation site. Um, you, should, you should absolutely go and look it up if you're curious about a different language script or language font. But kind of giving you these stats to be able to gauge what kind of sizing we are talking about. So given that universe that we are working in, where we have 115 web fonts and we are dealing with 66 default language, you know, web fonts that are being used for different languages, um, we have faced a lot of challenges in the last you know, three year, two years as we have uh, from 2011 onwards where we have built out web fonts and we have continued to tune the way we use it and consume it on the Wiki Wikimedia websites. Uh, Wikipedia is one of the largest consumers of it, but then there are other uh, Wiki projects also, sister projects like Wikivoyage, which is also a text-heavy site as you know, and Wikisource which actually also has a lot of digitized content where these fonts are very, very valuable and well appreciated by the uh, users who are using and contributing content there. Um, so getting into one of the first challenges, which is a major challenge for any, any large website, at, and especially at Wikipedia scale, where we are serving half a billion unique users uh, every month, uh, is that how do we actually distribute fonts to so many users at a large scale. We cannot just you know, have a uh, brute force method, if you will, of uh, being able to just push fonts to everybody because you know, that just think of the storm that it creates in terms of being able to push fonts to everybody just by brute force, whether they need it or not, right? So what, what are those issues there? And uh, sorry, um, and, and looking at that, we do need to take into account 
certain kinds of considerations to optimize for that distribution. Right? So distribution of web fonts is actually the largest scale uh, category of problems and issues and challenges in terms of technical challenges which are tied in into the architecture of the sites that uh, we are deploying on uh, as well as the kinds of assets that is the language fonts that we are distributing. So there are four areas that I'd like to kind of touch upon. Uh, one is but that it is uh, high bandwidth consumption, right? That is when we are distributing fonts, it's an expensive process. And Wikimedia is a foundation, it's a nonprofit you know, organization, and the money, much of the, we do care about the usage costs. I mean, we, we don't have the budgets of Google or Facebook that we should, we can just say that, hey, that doesn't matter. So we do want to have a good engineering solution which is intelligently built where we do have an awareness of high bandwidth consumption and minimizing and optimizing that as much as possible. The second area is cache eviction. So what happens when caches change? That is when people are updating stuff, they're interacting with the pages and the cache gets updated, right? And if, when, when a cache is updated, the fonts that you may have cached may disappear. You need to download them at that point. So I'll touch upon that area. Uh, repeated font downloads. So what, what are the instances when fonts are downloaded very often and at the scale that we are talking of, of half a billion users given any given point in time, want to be very sensitive about that. And the fourth is large font footprint. Is how do we minimize and optimize the footprint of the um, assets, the fonts that we are distributing. So I want to talk about some of the solutions there in three different areas of uh, uh, thinking and, and design work. One is font optimization. That is, first of all, smartly detecting on a page what fonts are needed on that page, right? So that's, uh, you need to understand the problem that you are addressing before you're actually serving those fonts. So font detection in terms of understanding smartly what, you, what kind of fonts you have on a page, uh, how many languages you may be serving. So that's called a mixed script, mixed font uh, scenario, where the number of scripts uh, also determines the kind of detection algorithms that you're using. And then the, third, the other area is tofu detection. How many of you know what tofu is? Come on. Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you have to. So tofu means uh, no uh, blocks. You have seen those tofu blocks, right? They're called tofu blocks. When you see the, the characters not being rendered, the squares that you see usually are called tofu blocks, okay? <laughs> now you know. So, <laughs> so <laughs> tofu blocks basically mean that your language script is not on, you know, available as a font for that page. And whenever you see that, you know that the language or the font that you were looking for is not available. So we want to be able to detect smartly ahead of time whether, you know, what is the percentage of TOFU we are seeing and what kind of, you know, algorithms we can use to be able to detect the s blocks that we have to be able to say, okay, so we have X percentage of TOFU on this page, right? The, right. The clever thing you're doing is that um, I, I talked to David about it. Basically, one of the strategies is you take a character that you know can be very non-square, like for instance, in English. Yep. Yes, exactly. Um, and this led to one of my coworkers lead a uh, writing function with the amazing name Detect Chinese Tofu. Exactly. <laughs> which is which is like a complete yeah, and, and <laughs> you never think. <laughs> but you need context. It could be tofu in other ways too. But in Chinese actually it is the most difficult to detect. Because, you know, the the characters are usually nice and square and they are they actually are symmetrical in the way they are being rendered as each glyph. So Chinese actually is the most difficult use case for tofu detection. And none of the algorithms are even 90% accurate, right? Again, 
it's something that needs to be is continually refined as we train and and improve that uh, algorithm susan no well it's you can see it as a square but it's not a renderable character so is the browser just that yes yes that's correct That's correct. I mean, you're doing that programmatically. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, so that's that's the first part. Then the second part of optimizing fonts is reducing the actual footprint of what you're delivering. You know, how do you optimize uh, the font uh, that you're distributing and making it really optimal? So there are three components in that: stripping, compressing, subsetting. Okay, and that means that you are uh, basically pulling out. So when you're looking at a font, right, and you have characters set in a in a language, if you see that there are glyphs that are not being used often enough, strip them out. So you're basically pulling out characters like you could have musical notations in a Latin font. You could in a font family, right, in a in a specific font. You pull them out. If you see that that is not something that is being used, you smartly actually build the font by pulling out and, and including only the characters that are used. And you can do that over time by actually analyzing the kind of content that you have and building a font that is uh, very optimal for that. The second is compression. There are really, really some fantastic, uh, really cool algorithms which are coming out. Uh, WAF and EOT are used most often nowadays. You'd see a .WAF file for a font. So a .WAF is a web font, right? And there is a WAF2 compression, which is uh, in the works. Google is working on that. And there are other uh, compression uh, uh, formats, such as uh, uh, ZipFly and other formats, which are more optimal. And you can really make the size very small. And then the third category of reducing a font footprint is subsetting. And that's very similar to um, building an autonym font, for example, which is a font that we have built by only picking the characters that we use. Uh, but font subsetting is done dynamically on the fly when it is rendered, right? So it's, again, what time in the process you're introducing that um, subsetting in. Uh, and um, I'll talk about it a bit later, but font subsetting is also being introduced in the CSS specification. So the W3 uh, font CSS font specification, if you look at it, it's actually one of the uh, addendums in, in that discussion. So the, the first area was font optimizations. The second one is caching, right? That is, how do you optimally cache in order to be able to distribute widely, fast, and so, right? So one is that you try to uh, cache fonts as much as possible on the client side, right? So that it's not something that you're hitting your server with all the time in terms of downloads. The second is that there are two levels of caching, at least, that are occurring. One is at the CSS level. That is, if you're invoking and calling a font from the CSS, right? And you can cache that for 24 hours. That's a cheap. Uh, call, because if, you, if it needs to be refreshed, it's cheap to do compared to downloading a font, right? So, and the caching period for a font can be one year, which means that if there is a font that you used in the last one year, you at least will not have to go and download it again in that time period if you already have used it, right? So that in immediately, if you're looking at half a billion users, right, it creates that much optimization to be able to not hit the server and have that traffic going back and forth, right? So caching is very important. There are also other caching strategies that are being looked at, which uh, large sites are experimenting with, um, which is multi-level caching at different uh, segments, whether that's on the client, whether that's on the server, whether that's in different levels of cache that are being used on the serving infrastructure that is being used. So that's another area. 
and then the third is downloading, right? That is the actual uh, point when a download occurs. And uh, there are some very interesting parts that we have uh, looked at and have been looking. Um, we have a component that actually Rowan worked on at, along with Trevor called the resource loader, um, which uh, basically allows us to load our JavaScript optimally. And Rowan, you're welcome to add more to that. But you know, in general, that's the idea that how. Yes, so watch his talk. It will be available <laughs> on recording. Then the second is, of course, writing good code. So you know, actually having clean, clean JavaScript and clean CSS, where you don't have uh, a lot of uh, dangling, uh, you know, code co constructs, and and you really are optimizing and cleaning up your code in the way you are calling fonts or the way you're invoking, you're calling your CSS, your CSS is executing. Um, then the uh, third thing I talked about was the font subsetting, which I referred to earlier. This is you know, when you're actually downloading, you're basically creating a subset of a font on the fly. And right now, as I said, this is something that exists in HarfBuzz, which is a font renderer that integrates with, for Chrome. It's the font rendering engine for Chrome. And that is an open source project which actually has a font subsetter which is being used for many of the non-Latin languages specifically. And then, of course, enabling cross-site caching, which means that you, should be, you could potentially access across sites something that has been cached already. You go and look up, do a smart lookup, and you don't download, right? So these are all strategies, all techniques for optimizing uh, what you are downloading and what you're not. OK, so these are different areas, but there's a lot of small bits that are being optimized uh, for performance considerations and distribution at such a large scale. And we are 500 million. Facebook is 1.3 billion. Google is even higher, right? So again, if you're looking at the scale of things, it really, really matters how much you tune and optimize in each of those areas. So um, I want to walk you through this very interesting diagram. Again, I will send, you know, for those of you who are interested, there is a link uh, on MediaWiki. This is actually there. You can download it and look at it in more detail. Sorry about the small size of the font. Uh, but I just want to walk you through the, what we do as a workflow in terms of determining when a web font is applied, right? That is, we, we want to be as smart as possible in terms of figuring out when do we apply a web font, right? And we don't really want to apply it until we've checked everything else. So that means that we need, so our simple requirement from a user perspective is that we want to display text for a specific language, right? Um, we go and check if the system fonts or the browser fonts are already available for that language script. If they are, then we blacklist it in terms of not downloading a web font. Okay, so it's the other way around. It's, it's the reverse way. That is, if it is available on the system or on the browser, we are not going to go on further in terms of the process of going and applying and getting a web font. But if it is not, then we will move ahead. So uh, we don't have, then we are assuming that we need a web font. We move further. We look at it and see if the user has actually, and Wikipedia, if you go into your preferences as a logged in user, can actually go and select the languages that you care about in terms of, you know, most users are multilingual on Wikipedia. So you could select English, German, and Dutch, for example. And um, you could specify fonts for each one of those, if you wish. Right? You could take the default, or you could actually specify a specific kind of font that you like. So we're going and checking and seeing you know, what preference you're setting as a user, or in, is it a call that you're making through CSS where you're setting the font family? Because we can get that info from either place. Um, if it is, uh, the, if the font is in C in this, uh, invoked in the CSS, is an autonym font, that is, we have already created an autonym font where we have actually optimized 
what is being used, what is the character set being used on Wikipedia most of the time. So if it is, if the CSS is invoking the autonym font, we will go and push that, right? But if it is not, then we'll move forward and go and look for other web fonts that we have. So um, in the case that we now know that web fonts is absolutely required, we don't even need the autonym font, we're going and then starting to uh, run tofu detection, right? That is, we're going to figure out now what uh, language uh, this, uh, how many mixed font, uh, is this a mixed font page? How many fonts are required? We do run a tofu detection to make sure that you know, the page that is being rendered actually is also seeing tofu. So there really is a need for web fonts to be downloaded. And then we will actually go and download the font. So we, we are doing a fair bit of analysis up, up uh, you know, ahead, ahead of page uh, load. And that's, again, you can stare at this. This is only one use case, right? Because again, there are variations on this depending on the complexity of the mixed language scripts that may be present and the mixed fonts that may be available. So that's, that's a large, huge area. Distribution is a massive area. And those are some of the performance categories that we are hitting very actively in terms of tuning. The others are, the next challenge is that there aren't enough web fonts. Believe it or not, there aren't enough web fonts available which are openly licensed, high quality, and easy to read and easy to render for different languages. So the moment you step out of English, right, that is Latin character sets, it just completely drops off the earth. It's even in you know, a language as widely used as Chinese, doesn't really have very, very cool, uh, beautifully built uh, uh, glyphs for different fonts, right? You'd be surprised. So when you go into Indic languages, you go into Arabic, you go into Hebrew, there isn't enough diversity in the fonts, let alone the fonts sometimes themselves. So there is a need for having more and more web fonts. And uh, there are three initiatives that are very active at this point in time, which you can go and look up online. One is the Google Web Fonts Project. Uh, it is actually associated with Google Docs. And, and because Google Docs is consuming those fonts for you know, being able to support different language scripts, so therefore, the Google Web Fonts project is actually driving a huge number of fonts coming in to be available on the web, which are open sourced and open licensed, which is very important for reuse and redistribution, right? Then you also have an Adobe Web Fonts project, which also has a huge number of fonts that are rolling in. Adobe is trying to roll in, but they're not as huge as the number Google is rolling out. Because Adobe, again, is you know, in the fonts market, right? They have been selling fonts and making a great living for so long. But as the web starts consuming the different kinds of fonts that people are using for different languages, it really, really is being driven by large players like Google, where they're like, hey, I don't care whether Google, you know, Adobe makes the fonts available for free or not, but we will. Because we need to render content on a Google Doc for these languages. Right? And if there is not that font available, we'll go and buy one and release it. So it's, it's good for us, it's good for Wikipedia, because then we can consume that too, because they're open sourced and open licensed. And then of course, we have a whole bunch of fonts, as I indicated earlier, which are also open sourced, high quality, and can be reused. So these are all repositories, which are very important uh, for anyone who is looking at Latin and non-Latin script fonts. Then the third, Another challenge is the inconsistencies in rendering fonts, right? If you go across different kinds of web browsers, whether that is uh, Chrome or IE or Firefox or Safari, again, the, the way that a font is displayed and the process that is followed is inconsistent. It's not always a standard user experience. It's different for different. You'll sometimes see uh, how many of you know of the Fout problem, which is that there's a flash before, you know, of unstyled text before the font is actually loaded. You'll see that actually render and then change, right? And that's an inconsistency in the way that Chrome doesn't do that, but Firefox does, for example, right? So there, that is one of the issues. The second is uh, the transfer latency. How long does it take to load, 
the different mechanisms and algorithms that different browsers are using for loading a page. And based on that, what is the user perceived response? Because that becomes even more important and magnified when you're talking about mobile. Because when you're looking at a mobile page, you want it to be even more optimized than a web page on a, on a desktop, right? So again, these um, components get even more highlighted and you have to actually build smarter solutions around those in order to address that, those variations and inconsistencies. And then of course, there's the best solution is that it has to come into the standard. That is when the standard becomes consistent and actually recognizes that as a problem, um, like font subsetting is coming in, then you have consistency in the way the font is getting rendered and loaded initially, right? And that's very important because that immediately has an impact on the user experience of what the user is looking at on the page and how long are they waiting and how soon are they looking at uh, aesthetically pleasing font. So these are small components, but they're actually very integral to the way web browsers are uh, rendering content today. The fourth area, which is system support uh, for web fonts is flaky again, at best, right? So again, I shouldn't say flaky, but it's inconsistent, right? So uh, what that means is that web browsers, different web browsers that you all use, whether that's Chrome or Firefox or IE or Safari, uh, do not all support the same language scripts, right? They're all at different levels of support when it comes and you move across different browsers. Even the different versions have completely different levels of support when it comes to languages and language scripts and variants. And it makes a huge difference the moment you step out. Like even if you look at uh, Portuguese, if you look at Brazilian Portuguese versus uh, Portuguese uh, itself, it's a variant, right? And the characters that are being used may be different. So again, uh, what is supported? and what is not by default, what renders in your mobile browser and your mobile OS versus not. So there is a fair bit of inconsistency in the user experience of whether as an application developer, you can write uh, an application which has a consistent user experience across all the browsers where you are serving your users. It's, it's a massive grid, right? You can envision, okay, these are the languages that are not supported in these uh, different ver versions of these browsers. So um, again, you'll see that browsers have, uh, have started you know, supporting the modern browser versions especially, have support, started supporting more and more language scripts. Uh, the system OSs are actually behind at this point in time because people are starting to use more mobile devices and more laptops, and, and so the browser is more the center of the universe in one sense, especially from a Wikimedia content world than the system OS itself, whether that's Windows or whether that's Mac OS or whether that's Linux, whatever, right? And then of course, as we go into the world of mobile, mobile web browsers still lagging behind and mobile OSs are too because it's again a brand new environment, brand new platform where its font support is rolling in gradually. And it, it is again, um, Android is very aggressively pushing um, uh, you know, rollout of different language scripts, but it is again gated by the, uh, their rollout timelines. And it is also gated by the kind of testing that they have to do. Because just think, you have to ensure that you are certifying every version every uh, you know, version of a browser against support for a particular language, a particular font, and a, and a particular matrix, right? So it's, it's, again, it's slow moving, but it's happening. So in the meantime, what do we do? We are Wikipedia, and um, we use modern browser versions, and we use mobile OSs. And we keep filing bugs upstream so that we can keep reporting problems, which then hopefully Android and Chrome and Firefox, they pick up and start to keep rolling it into their uh, timelines. So having said that, those are the four areas I wanted to talk about. Um, what is the future? 
what is the long term goal that I would like to see accomplished in the next year and the next two years. Uh, but it needs to be done relatively soon. And it's actually, there's a significant amount of work that is going on in this area already, right? So the first is you need to provide fonts, right? In a multilingual world where we are supporting uh, Asian languages, different language scripts, different kinds of fonts. We are uh, even on Wikipedia where 50% of the content is not Latin uh, scripts versus 50% non-Latin. We want to be able to uh, plug and play and, and provide what we need to to our users. So providing fonts through a scalable content delivery network, that is a CDN, with an API, which is simple, easy to use, and intuitive to a developer, is key. It's a new service, literally. It's where in the world of you know, scalable uh, systems, you are delivering fonts as a service. And the distribution of fonts, then, that is the only way to address it long term, where there are services which are delivering nice APIs and delivering fonts as you need them. Um, Optimize for mobile. So if I am you know, building apps for Android, 4.4.4, uh, we just rolled out. I want to be able to say, hey, I'm, this is my version for my OS. Give me the fonts which are optimized for this, for this language. And I want to be able to just call an API. I don't want to go and write all this optimization every time I go and use fonts for a specific language. So that's where the world is moving to, right? And um, the same thing applies to broadband web experience, too. It is as People use uh, different kinds of devices. Uh, and, and as wearable computing even comes in, you want fonts to be everywhere. And it is something that is, has to be ubiquitous. Cannot be made ubiquitous without being a service. So I envision a future where um, that whole infrastructure actually becomes seamless for the user, for the developer. Providing fonts, distributing fonts. And all to ensure a consistent user experience. Uh, one of the good projects I'd like to mention at this point in time, which we are actually helping and working on uh, and uh, interacting and working with Google pretty closely, is the Google Fonts API. You should take a look. If you're interested, I'll send you the URL. Drop me an email. Um, and this is towards the direction of fonts as a service where all these open uh, you know, fonts that are being collected for web fonts and uh, are now getting to be built as a CDN and API by Google um, to be pulled by application developers to use. And ideally, you just don't want only Google to do this. You actually want other, when, you know, other organizations, other open source projects to do it too because the only way web fonts can stay open and they become, their distribution becomes a standard way of thinking is by having multiple players distributing and providing those fonts APIs, that service as fonts. Because again, Google has its own uh, services that it wants to f uh, focus and provide support for first. But you want other folks too, like Wikimedia, you know, could provide a service for the fonts that we have so far. Um, Adobe could. Uh, there could be other open source projects that are uh, rendering engines that could, right? So again, you want different vendors. Red Hat has a whole series of open source fonts that they could distribute also. So again, having a larger service, which is defined as a specification, but being available for being used and consumable in the mobile world that we are getting into. It really is a global experience, and you want to keep that uh, plug and play. Wherever those assets are, should be able to inject them into that API and make them available easily. All right, so I think I'm done, which is good timing. And uh, so you can email me anytime. That's my email address. And if you have any questions, you see any problems, uh, we are constantly looking at the fonts uh, issues that we are um, constantly optimizing. So please feel free to ping me if I can help you in any way, you know, guide you. Uh, provide a reference or a resource that you can go and look at. Happy to do that. 
and um, thank you for listening. Any questions? Not, not very often, for, fortunately, because usually if it is a good, if it's an um, aesthetically well done font, which is a difficult resource and a difficult effort to do to begin with, then you will usually not have that kind of change where, unless the Unicode standard changed and a new character got in, uh, introduced, and that can happen. So for example, if a new font uh, if a set of code points come into Unicode, right, where there are glyphs and characters that are getting defined for a particular language family, and a font vendor decides to include them in a font, right, it could be anybody who's building that font, it could be an individual designer who's doing it. Then, if that's something that we are, uh, if that got updated, we have to update at that point, but it's not very often yet. Any other questions? Yeah, um, you mentioned No, you can actually load and define quite a few. Yes, yes. In fact, that's what they're trying to do now, right? That is, when you do a Chrome update or you do an uh, Android update, there's a whole set of fonts that are rolling in which are not on the system. Is there a list of any of those? Yes, they're, they are um, on um, the Chrome sites. I can send you the URL. Yeah, yeah. If you uh, send me a note, and uh, it's, it's basically there's a whole set of fonts, uh, hundreds of them, that are listed that uh, actually are getting pushed through Chrome, uh, which are not on the system default. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how much bandwidth Wikipedia uses per day? I don't. I'd have to ask the ops, our ops team. But I can get it for you. It's it's actually publicly listed. I can send you the link. They're all, they're all publicly listed, so definitely. But, but it's, it is all, you can see it, if check it any time. Susan. I mean, and, and I mean, that's a good question, Susan. And, and we do realize that there is an issue, but it hasn't, we are not there yet. That is, for example, um, when we have enough web fonts. So one of the things is that the moment you have a world of web fonts that are being provided for English, for example, online, right? At that point, the privacy issue and in terms of what is available on a per and person's uh, system, what can the browser see and what else can the browser see uh, becomes very, very sensitive, right? But for most of the languages that we are trying to support today, the key issue is that there is not even a font that can render that content. So they haven't actually reached the point. I wish we were living in the luxury of hundreds of fonts there. <laughs> because at that point, yes, it does become an issue where content uh, creators do care about what exactly is on their system. And, and I would say that's kind of a first world problem today. <laughs> it isn't actually a problem in many of the font uh, language scripts that we are trying to support with web fonts because we have a chicken and egg problem there 
of the amount of content versus providing the fonts and assets to be able to develop it. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, we do absolutely. I mean, please ping me again. You know, we. Yes. Right. Right. Yes, that's correct. And, and you know, you'd be amazed, though, in the open source communities. There are many, many font designers who are, you know, in different parts of the world who are individual font designers. And they uh, actually do contribute. There is a uh, project called Font Forge, which is a very popular uh, platform for many of font designers to participate and discuss together and create open source fonts. Uh, but in the world that we live in, in terms of non-Latin language scripts, not even having the basic fonts available, we absolutely want individual contributions and font designers to be honored and, and actually supported for their work. Yes, because you know it's so difficult to create glyphs accurately otherwise. So that's, again, a, a huge area that is just, you know, again, coming and rising up as more and more content gets um, desired for by a user and not enough content exists on the web.